It's time to expand our horizons, friends. More specifically, it's time to take a deep dive behind the scenes of Modern Horizons. <music> Greetings, owners of fine luxury cardboard rectangles. Today, we're going to be taking a look behind the scenes of Modern Horizons. We're going to see how a bunch of cards came to be, the inspiration behind them, little tidbits about magic design, all sorts of just delicious details for those of you who are like me and like the flavor and also like knowing about some of the processes that Wizards of the Coast uses when creating cards. Honestly, when I went through all this, because I have to do that part before I record this part, I actually learned some things I didn't know. And that's a nice feeling. I mean, it's always good to have your suspicions confirmed, but it's even better to learn brand new things you had no clue about. So what we're gonna do is we're going to go through the behind the scenes notes of a whole bunch of Modern Horizons cards. It's gonna be a lot of fun, so let's do this thing. So this Insider Look article is called Modern Times, and we are gonna dive right in and start looking at this juiciness before we head on to Core 2020, which is right down the pike. All right, starting out with Ayula, Queen Among Bears, and I love this card. One green, one colors for a 2-2 legendary bear. Whenever another bear enters the battlefield under your control, choose one. Put two plus one plus one counters on target bear. Or target bear you control fights target creature you don't control. Imagine if it's a target bear you control fights target bear you don't control. I'm queen amongst bears. Bow down and serve me, bears. Show me your bear loyalty. Ha <laughs> ha. So the flavor text says, born from the oldest red cedar, nursed on the sap of the tallest spruce, coronated under the mightiest pine. And you see uh, Ayula, very, very awesome. So let's let's actually read what's what he has to say about it here. Uh, uh, Ethan Fleischer, the co-lead designer of the set, loves bears. He has a bear-themed commander deck, and he's always on the lookout for a cool new bear or bear-themed tribal card. In Core Set 2019, for which he was the lead set designer, he managed to get in Goreclaw, Terror of Cal Sisma. Goreclaw is amazing. I love Goreclaw. Do they uh, show you the card? There you go. I like that. I like that you can hover over it. Goreclaw here is amazing. The very first legendary bear. But that was card, that card was more about helping large creatures than specifically helping bears. So Ethan was still eager to make a tribal bear themed commander. Imagine working for Wizards of the Coast and there's some pet deck you have and you're like, I want cards specifically for this deck. And then you can just make them. How amazing is that? So, uh, basically, Modern Horizons is the perfect place to include this because of its nostalgic theme and the changeling tribal glue. One day, Ethan came into a vision design meeting and said, Today, we're making a tribal bear commander. The biggest challenge of the design is that bears as a tribe aren't particularly all that strong. This meant that the bear commander had to help turn a bunch of mediocre tutus into powerful creatures. After some brainstorming, we liked the idea that every bear would trigger some effect when cast. Putting two plus one plus one counters on target bears sounded cool because it would make the bears bigger and scarier. I also like that bears are 2-2 two -two and the two plus one plus one counters is like another bear. That's like another 2-2. Two -two. So, you obviously could always choose to put the counters on the bear that was entering the battlefield. Having your bear fight another creature also felt cool as it was super flavorful. Rather than choosing between the two effects, it was a rare after all, we decided to include both as they seemed synergistic. Build up your bears until they're big enough and then start having them fight. The one tweak that happened during set design was the team added a bunch of cards that made bear tokens, so they reworked the card to trigger when bears entered the battlefield under your control, so it would be triggered by the creation of all the bear tokens. I like, I've liked bears since the beginning of Magic, so to me this is a really dope card. I'm glad that they decided to do this. Next up we've got the slivers, and you can see a number here. Oh, that's funky how it blacks uh, black and whites out the uh, the cards you're not focused on. That's a really neat feature. I like that. The first sliver here is the grossest sliver in the whole set. One of every color, Cascade, 7-7, seven, seven, and gives all your sliver spells Cascade. That's crazy times. So, one vision design meeting, we decided to focus on slivers. We knew we wanted to include them in the set because A, the fans have been clamoring for them, to return for quite a while, so slivers were a great choice for a nostalgic set. Yeah, thanks a lot. Now I have to listen to Richard going on about how he wants an emerical sliver, alright? The hardest part about making slivers 
is finding enough abilities to put on them. So a set where they had access to a huge number of mechanics was ideal. And C, the inspiration for this set was Time Spiral 2, and the slivers were such an iconic part of the Time Spiral block. This is all true. There were a ton of slivers in Time Spiral, and Modern Horizons does have a ton of mechanical room in it. So this is a good place to slide them in. I do not disagree. The meeting started innocently enough with us pitching some safe, obvious choices for things to put on slivers. But then we started to one-up each other, trying to come up with the craziest mechanics we could put on them. How about Outlast, really? That's, that's the craziest mechanic? That's your example? How about Unearth? How about Exalted? How about Cascade? Cascade is crazy. I'll give you that. And Exalted is... Eh, it pushes the line. We laughed and wrote them all down. Now, not all of our list made it onto cards, but a bunch of the craziest ones did. We ended up putting Cascade on our legendary five-color sliver. Magic has a history of making five-color legendary slivers. Sliver Queen. Let's see here. Sliver. Let's, let's, let's highlight them here. Sliver Queen, this is the original one. Dirty, dirty. Sliver Overlord. Sliver Legion. And Sliver Hive Lord. And each of these, with the exception of Sliver Hive Lord, happens to be a 7-7. Seven, seven. And we knew Modern Horizons needed to have one that stood out from the crowd. Well, they, they succeeded. The first Sliver stands out from the crowd. Although Sliver Queen almost feels like it would have been the first Sliver, but hey, whatever. Endling. Trivia question. What's the longest amount of time it's taken to finish a five-card cycle? As of Modern Horizons, the answer is now 21 years. It all started back in 1998 and Urza Saga with the card Morphling. Morphling is, was, was overpowered. It's still strong, but back in the day, damage used the stack. So you could use the, the bottom abilities here of the Morphling for just absolute gross nonsense, where you could give it plus one, minus one to crank it up to five power, put damage on the stack, and then you could use the minus one plus one to crank its toughness right up so that if it was interacting with a creature, it would survive the interaction. And the Morphling is just a dirty, dirty card. Now, what I found interesting is the card was originally going to be the card Clone. So Morphling was supposed to be Clone, and that explains the artwork, which I really like. Clone was in limited edition alpha, and due to rules issues, copying creatures have been off the table for new card designs. We thought we'd figure out how to make it work, so as a celebration of the event, we brought back the card clone to be printed in Urza Saga as a rare. It was originally an uncommon. Unfortunately, at the very last minute, after the art was in, you can see Morphling was riffing off the original art conceit of clone, we were told it couldn't be cloned and had to be changed. The card needed to match the art, so we thought about how to make a shapeshifter if we couldn't use copying. The idea we came up with was to give it a bunch of different abilities so it could change itself in numerous ways. We started by giving it plus one, minus one, and minus one, plus one, so it could change its size. We ended up giving it the ability to untap itself so it could attack and then block, flying for evasion, and shroud unnamed at the time to protect itself. The card ended up being both very powerful and popular. I wonder why. I mean, you loaded it down with powerful abilities. So, over the years, we made a bunch of different blue cards that made a nod towards Morphling. But nine years later, we made a set called Planar Chaos. The main conceit of the set was that it's an alternate reality where the color pie had followed the same philosophies, but it ended up in a different configuration of abilities. And thus we have Torchling. And you can see Torchling has the same two end abilities as Morphling, but its other abilities vary. You can still untap it, but you can force blocks with this, and you can change the target of spells with this. So that's where it varies from the Morphling. Same casting cost, same power and toughness, but in red. One of the things we did in the set was take existing cards and make alternate reality versions. Why not do that with Morphling, but put in red instead? We liked the idea that we could keep five abilities, including the plus one, minus one ability, and the minus one, plus one ability, but change out the three activated abilities requiring a single colored mana to add abilities that a color had access to. As it was Player Chaos, red had access to a different group of abilities than normal. If you guys don't know, Planar Chaos was where everything was color shifted into different colors and everything was redistributed in terms of abilities. So, untapping was red, so Torchling had the same first ability as Morphling. Then instead of Evasion, we gave an ability that could force blocking. Finally, rather than Shroud, we gave it a defensive ability that could redirect spells that targeted. Its first name was Torchling to make sure it was clear this was an alternate reality Morphling. The plan had never been to make a cycle of these cards, and it's interesting to note, actually, the abilities that they gave it are basically mostly blue. Like, untap a blue ability, changing the target of a spell, blue ability. This would change later on in Magic, but still, 
it mostly has abilities that could fit on the original Morphling because those were blue abilities. So, to continue, the plan had never really been to make a cycle of these cards, but two years later, while designing Conflux, we stumbled across the idea of making a green version of Morphling. Oh, Thornling, Daddy loves you so much. Five mana for a 4-4. Four, four. Its abilities are to gain haste, trample, or indestructible. <laughs> Love that. And, of course, it has the plus one, minus one abilities. So, it again had these abilities, but its three other abilities were just things green had access to. Haste, trample, and indestructible. With the third ability, again, being something defensive to protect it. I like that, that the third ability is a protective ability. It was named Thornlings and continued the pattern. We got the fourth one when they did it in Battle Bond. First ability, Vigilance. Second, Life Link. Third, return it to your owner's hand. It, I should say, return it to its owner's hand. And then the standard other. And look, they wrapped the other two abilities into one statement, which actually makes a lot of sense. And the artwork for this is gorgeous. I genuinely really, really love this artwork. I love the armor, the purple hair, the whole... It's, it's so cool. I love it. Then there was a nine-year gap where we didn't make either the white or black Morphling. Finally, in Battle Bond, we discovered a place to make the white Morphling. Uh, the two abilities were combined to, uh, to make a single line to save space. The first two abilities were Vigilance, similar to Morphling and Torchings on tap ability, and Lifelink. Its defensive ability was self-bounce to put it back in your hand if it was ever in danger of dying. And then we come to the final, the final step on our journey, Endling. Endling followed Brightling's condensing of the plus one and minus one abilities. It got Menace and Death Touch, and then Undying as its defensive activation. Endling is the first Morphling to use a non-evergreen keyword, but that felt apropos, apropos as it was in Modern Horizons. Note that it's, only, it's the only card in the whole set to use the Undying ability. So Undying is a non-evergreen ability, and you can actually see this when you look at the card. That's why it's explained. They don't explain Menace and Death Touch, because those are evergreen. And people are expected to know the evergreen keywords just through being exposed to them so much, where Undying is not used nearly as frequently. So, just 21 years later, 21 short years later, we finally finished. I like it. I like seeing the cycle completed. It made me happy. Everdream. Oh, God, the artwork is so gorgeous. One blue, one colorless, draw a card, splice on to an instant or sorcery for a blue and two colorless. So, in Champions of Kamigawa Development, I created a Kamigawa! I created Splice as a way to add a Spells Matter element to the set. The mechanic allows you to essentially staple the effects of a card with this mechanic onto another spell. I remember when I first saw Splice, it confused me because I thought you discarded the card as part of the splice cost. So I'm like, I don't get it. If this card splices on, why wouldn't I just cast it individually? But after a few rereads through, I went, oh, I get it. It's adding into the card. Splice was a bit of a tricky one to wrap my head around for me originally. And there was a number of people who felt that way at the time. So the mechanic allows you to essentially staple the effects of a card with this mechanic onto another spell. In Champions of Kamigawa, that spell had to have the subtype Arcane, which made it very limited. I realized late in the development that it might be possible to splice onto instants and sorceries rather than onto a specific spell subtype, but that discovery came too late in the process to change things. I'd always hoped one day we'd be able to bring splice back and broaden it to make it more backward compatible. We tried splice onto instant and sorcery cards as the isn't mechanic in Guilds of Ravnica, but it didn't work out. The mechanic is only on two cards in Modern Horizons, but it's a chance to finally let all of you give it a go. Your feedback, as well as watching how it does in gameplay, will inform us whether and or how soon we will bring this back. I like, honestly, I like getting these inside pieces of information. I like learning that Kamigawa, if, if it had had more development time, would have ended up with that in there. It's interesting to think about this being an, an is it ability. It makes me wonder what made them decide to scrap it specifically for is it, and will this come back? Is it something they will use again? Ha <laughs> ha! So overall, love the artwork on this card, and I'm 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 okay with the splice onto ability. I'd be all right with them putting it on more cards. Feaster of Fools, Hogak, Arisen Necropolis, and Throws of Chaos. So we've got all three of these lined up here. I've explained that when I originally pitched my idea for the Hackathon, uh, the Hackathon is how they put together Modern Horizons. I called my idea Future Sight 2. One of my favorite things about Future Sight's design was the use of mix and match spells that combined two different non-evergreen keywords on the same card. Same card. I and others designed a whole bunch of them for Modern Horizons, but they tended to get pretty wordy, 
So only three made it through the process to print, and these are those three. Feaster of Fools combines two mechanics that both want you to have a lot of creatures, Convoke and Devour. The idea is that your creatures can be used to make your demon cheaper to cast, and then can be sacrificed as it enters the battlefield to make it bigger. With four creatures, you can have an 11-11 for two black. That's pretty beefy. Hogak, Arisen Necropolis. This guy is this guy is cool, honestly. He's a really cool card. Artwork is super flavorful. I really like the flavor behind him. So, Hogak, Arisen Necropolis combines two cost reduction mechanics, Convoke and Delve. It doesn't matter whether you have creatures on the battlefield or in your graveyard, or other cards in your graveyard. There are many ways to pay. Hogak even lets you cast it from your graveyard, lining up with the flavor of the Delve mechanic. Throws of Chaos allows you to turn itself and later other lands in your hand into random spells in your library that cost three or less. The synergy is very useful, as it turns dead land draws in late game into actual spells. I hope you all enjoy the touch of Future Sight in the set. I know I do. I appreciate it. Generous Gift. So, in New Phyrexia, we printed a card called Beast Within. And these are essentially the exact same card with a different casting cost. They both cost uh, one mana of their color and two colorless. They're both instants to destroy target permanent. And the owner of that permanent, or controller, I should say, of that permanent, gets a 3-3 green elephant creature token. So in these both make 3-3 three, three creatures. This is an elephant, this is a beast. So there's a slight difference between the two. One of green's weakness is its over-reliance on creatures. In particular, it's not supposed to be able to kill a creature without having a creature itself. This is why fight is green's main weapon in most sets. It uses its own creatures to take out the opponent's creatures. Beast within references creatures as it makes it a token, but it doesn't require a creature to play. Thus, it allows green to do something it's not supposed to do. Remove a creature threat without itself having any creature. It's one of green's biggest color pie breaks. And the color pie, for those of you who don't know, is how they determine what abilities belong to what colors. I often state this on my blog, which leads to the following question. Okay, if green isn't supposed to do this, what color is? The answer I always give is white. White is the best at overall removal and is the color that most often gives the opponent something when it destroys one of their permanents. If Modern Horizons was Time Spiral 2, maybe it would be cool to get a little a little planar chaos in. Now we don't want to create any more color pie breaks, but color shifting a card into its correct color was fair game. And that's how a white beast within made it into the set. After that, we've got Goblin Oriflame, and I talked about how this one was a nod to the old Alpha Orcish Oriflame. So, Alpha is famous for having a number of misprints. One of them was a card called Orcish Oriflame. The card is supposed to cost a red and three colors, but was accidentally costed on its alpha version at a red and a colorless. It was fixed in beta, but for a while in the early days, tournaments had cards function as printed rather than have all cards worked the same. Oracle hadn't become a thing yet. That made the alpha or Orcish Oriflame a stronger card, because if you had the beta one, you'd have to pay four to cast it. It was actually restricted in the very first banned and restricted list. Interestingly, time has shown that the red Nicola's cost isn't remotely close to being broken. In fact, it's perfectly printable in modern. It's perfectly printable in standard, in all honesty. It's not super strong. The first version of this card was named Alpha Oriflame to lean into the joke. The finished card ended up being themed as a goblin card, but the word Oriflame was kept as a nod to the original design. One final piece of trivia. I designed this card for the original Time Spiral, but it didn't end up making it to print. Probably because it wasn't good enough. All right, next up. Mirrored and Besieged. I like this card a lot. Encapsulating a whole set in one card is a lot of fun. Let me geek out for a moment. This card was made during set design, as I saw it for the first time in the set's slideshow. I don't know whose idea it was to combine the anchor words of Cons of Tarkir block, the whole choose cons or dragons thing, with the Mirren Phyrexian War, but it's a thing of brilliance. The Mirren side feels Mirren, the Phyrexian side feels Phyrexian, yet both sides play beautifully in an artifact theme deck, and it even gets another magic set name on and it even gets another magic set name onto a card title. It's a card that could only be made in Modern Horizons. I actually really like Mirror to Besiege. This feels like a really, really cool card. The artwork's great. This whole thing ties together perfectly. After that, we've got Nature's Chant. This is uh, we made this for a card. We made this card during the hackathon and we're inspired to try and make a full 10 card cycle out of it. For each color pair, we want an iconic spell that appeared at the same cost in both colors. So Nature's Chant was created out of Disenchant and Naturalize. We tried, we really tried, 
but we never got a cycle that lived up to this first card. So in the end, we just made the cool card by itself. I'm underwhelmed by this card in all honesty. All right, Pashalik Mons. This one's cool. Mons Johnson is a longtime friend of Richard Garfield and was a member of R&D for many years. His love of goblins was so intense that Richard made Mons's Goblin Raiders in Alpha. The Mons in the card title refers in world to Pashalik Mons, a great goblin leader. And you can actually see that because he's mentioned in the flavor text of goblins. It says Pashalik Mons and his raiders are the thunderhead that leads in the storm. So we tried many times over the year to make a Pashalik Mons card. For instance, it was in the design file handed off from the Time Spiral design team. We've talked about it being in various supplemental sets, including Commander decks. Somehow it always fell through the cracks and never got made. Modern Horizons finally writes this wrong by bringing Pashalik Mons to the people. We knew from the start he needed to be a tribal goblin card. I believe his activated ability was designed first. He was a leader of goblins and is forever connected to 1-1 one -one goblins because of his card in Alpha. The cost of sacrificing goblin requires him to have at least one other goblin to start, but from then on, he can sacrifice the goblin tokens he's generated. I really enjoy that his goblin army just grows over time. The static ability was added as a way to get some damage dealing onto the card in a way that organically tied to goblins and his activated ability. I'm curious to see what all the goblin fans are going to do with it, especially mods. How cool would it be to have cards that reference your name? Segovian Angel. Oh, I adore this card so much. It's so cute. One of the challenges of Modern Horizon was how to design French vanilla creatures, also known as creatures that just have evergreen keywords. Every set needs some, but Modern Horizons made designing them difficult as they needed a reason to feel like they fit in the set. While designing cards in the original Hackathon, I came up with the idea of doing a common cycle of Young Iconics, where I took famous creatures from the past and made smaller versions of them. I believe the earliest version of this card was, and it was a young Sarah Angel for three mana, you got a 2-2 flyer with Vigilance, instead of this one mana for a 1-1 one, one flyer with Vigilance. During Vision, Kelly Diggs came up with a way to one-up the joke making use of an old in magic joke, one that dated back to 1994 from Legends called Segovian Leviathan. This card is a 3-3, yet in the art it's shown swimming with whales that are tiny in comparison. Rather than just own up to the odd disconnect, the creative team at the time, then called Continuity, explained that this creature was from the plane of Segovia, and on that plane, everything is tiny. So when you summon a Leviathan, you're getting a much smaller creature than you might normally get if you summoned a Leviathan from any other world. Thus Segovia, the plane of tiny creatures, was born. I did an entire video about Segovia. I will link it in the end of the video for you guys to check out if you would like. Kelly's idea was to make the angel from Segovia as a way to explain its tiny size. Ethan liked the joke and shrunk the creature to a 1-1 to further play this up. The rest of the cycle got knocked out during vision design as it seemed funnier as a joke on a single card than a whole cycle. Segovian Angel managed to make it all the way to print, one of about 15 cards from the original Hackathon, it's supposed to be Hackathon there, to do so. Sisse Weather Like Captain. Now this one's extra interesting. One of the things we've been doing in supplemental sets of late is taking popular old characters that have a legendary creature card and doing an updated version. Sisse has proven a popular commander for her ability to fetch legendary cards out of your library. Her big drawback is that she's limited to just green and white cards, as that's her color identity. For those of you who don't know commander, color identity is all the mana symbols that show up on a card. So this Sisse actually has all five colors in her identity because of this ability. So the idea we had was to make a new Sisse, but one with five color identity to allow you to play whatever legendary cards you wanted. We made her mono white so she wasn't hard to cast, then made her fetching ability require one of every color to get Sisse her five color identity. We had the ability put the card directly into the battlefield as it costs a lot of mana to use, unlike the top ability of her original card. Then to encourage you to play all five colors, we made the static ability, which defines her size and how big of things she could fetch. As the co-creator of Weatherlight Saga, I'm always happy to see another Weatherlight crew member get a new card. I really like this because this shows that they're paying attention to what the fans of the game are doing and trying to make things that specifically speak to that. So this is nice service of Commander, and I genuinely appreciate that. And also, it also makes me excited to know that we can get more versions of characters we've already gotten. It's not limited. Maybe we'll get a new Gerard and things like that. That's cool to me. And it also means that we can have the Urza card that we have as a creature and also get Planeswalkers of them. Mm, I'm on board. Smiting Helix. 
One of the fun things of making a supplemental set aimed at enfranchised players is that you can make some pretty good in-jokes. Smiting Helix is a great example of this. It's making fun of the fact that card name deals 3 damage to any target and you gain 3 life is both a black ability and a red-white ability. This is definitely not a card you'd see in a standard legal set. It's, this is making fun of it? Where's the, where's the funny? It, it's, just, it's just straight up showcasing that black and red have these abilities. It's, I, don't, I don't see the joke. All right. Stirring Address, Mind Rake, and Scale Up. One of the tricks we used to design new cards with old mechanics was to look for faction-based mechanics and then explore the colors outside of that faction. I'll use Overload as my example. Overload was the is it mechanic in Return to Ravnica, which means we'd only ever design blue and red Overload cards. That gave us free reign to find interesting white, black, and green effects we could use with Overload as we'd mind out blue and red. Mind out, if you don't know what that means, it just means they had already explored the spaces they, they could with that Overload ability, and so it was only left to these other colors. The key to a good Overload design is finding an effect that's in color both as a single targeted effect and a mass effect. Because that's how overload spells work. They start out with a regular target, but if you're willing to pay more mana and scale it up, it also scales up how many things it hits and hits everything instead. So, the key to a good overload design is finding an effect that's in color both as a single target effect and a mass effect. For example, white's allowed to grant a single creature plus two, plus two, or all of its creatures plus two, plus two. White stops at plus two, plus two, as plus three or plus three, as plus three, plus three or greater is green's territory. Interesting. I would never noticed that in Magic. That's a nice little tidbit to know. Green, yeah, we get the big smash, and green's the best color. With a higher overload cost, this makes for good combat. Actually, before you run down to the comment, actually, blue's the best color. I know blue has the most abilities, but green is the most fun color. I don't care what you say. All right, so with a higher overload cost, this makes for a good combat trick that doubles as a late-game breakthrough card that helps win the game. Scale Up is a similarly designed card that allows the card to be played early and late. Mind Rake plays in reverse space, where it gets a cheaper overload cost because the targeted effect is stronger just making each opponent... What? what It plays... It gets a cheaper overload cost because the targeted effect is stronger. Oh, okay. It's saying it's it's actually weaker when you overload it because each... Uh, just making the opponent discard. So how it works is it's saying that the overload cost is cheaper because when you overload it, you actually have to discard as well. Each of these effects are something new because neither blue nor red could do them. Blue might change the size of a creature, but not to a 6-4. String of Disappearances. One blue. Return target creature to its owner's hand. Then that creature's controller may pay two blue. If the player does, they may copy the spell and choose a new target for the copy. Time for another round of Magic Trivia. String of Disappearances is a riff on what Magic card? Well, that's Chain Lightning, baby. Everybody knows that. There we go. The answer's Chain Lightning from Legends. It had to be. It's, it's the exact same thing. I remember that. That's a funky concept. As a card we often talk about riffing on, yet seldom ever... This is a card we often talk about riffing on, yet seldom ever do. If you knew this, you're quite the magic trivia whiz. Well, I didn't know that they keep talking about doing riffing on it, but I'm old school enough that I remember the days of Chain Lightning. These were highly sought after. Legends were not easy cards to come by. Alright, Sword of Sinew and Steel and Sword of Truth and Justice. And you can see the Sword of Fire and Ice and Sword of Light and Shadow down here. Original Mirrodin Block was the set that introduced equipment to the world. In Darksteel, we made two swords, each representing an internal conflict in magic. Both swords cost three to cast and two to equip. Each gave plus two plus two and protection from two colors represented in its conflict. Then each granted its user two saboteur abilities, things that trigger upon the equipped creature dealing combat damage to another player. They call that saboteur, but it feels clunky, so I can see why they've never made that into a keyword and just use it as internalized design terminology. One in each color referenced in the protection. The swords were powerful and popular. This also heavily hinted at a cycle. So for years I was asked, when are you going to finish the blank and blank sword cycle? Upon our return to Mirrodin and the Scars of Mirrodin block, we decided it was time to give the players what they wanted. Each set of that block had one missing sword. We ended up putting Red White Sword in New Phyrexia as it had to be themed as Mirren, but most of the plane had fallen to Phyrexians by that point. The resistance was Red White, so we felt it made sense for them to have the last sword. I like that. That's good flavor. We worked backwards from there, putting the Black Green Sword in the middle set to not have it overlap with the final sword, and the Green Blue Sword in the first set of the block. All of these swords followed the same pattern as the first two. Again, these cards were powerful and popular. Once we finished the cycle, we started getting rest requests for the allied swords because they had done enemy colored swords, 
Now people want the friendly colored swords. The problem was we'd realized the swords using the formula we'd realized that the swords using the formula that the enemy swords had all made equipment that was too strong for standard. We thought about making a slightly less powerful version of them, but felt that would make players more unhappy than happy. That is definitely true. We toyed with making shields that could follow a slightly different formula that would allow them to be related but less comparable, but ultimately decided it was better to find the right home one day and just put the allied swords there. It turns out that set was Modern Horizons. Well, for at least two of them. With the original swords being stretched out of many sites, many sets, it felt only right to mimic the enemy color swords and just start with two. We picked two combinations that didn't overlap in color and followed the old formula. The fact that these were going straight into modern meant we could have the power level higher than we'd be comfortable having it in standard. I look forward to you all enjoying the first two allied swords and await the many requests for the other three. Yeah, those will, those will keep coming in. Tribute Mage. This is another card that's trying to help complete a cycle. So we have Trinket Mage, right? That's the first one. It started back in 5th Dawn with the card Trinket Mage. 5th Dawn had a COG theme focusing on artifacts that cost 0 1. Trinket Mage was designed as a creature that tutored, got a card from your library, for COGs. Then came the Treasure Mage. So they made a Mirror of Trinket Mage with Treasure Mage, a creature that tutored only for expensive artifacts. So this one tutors up one cast. This one tutors up six cast artifacts. Then you've got Trophy Mage, and when Trophy Mage enters the battlefield, you search for an artifact that has three converted mana cost. It's, it's interesting how this one here basically is one or less, this one here is six or greater, this one here is specifically three, this one here, Trophy Mage, is specifically, to, or Tribute Mage I should say, is specifically two. So, Modern Horizons fills in the two slot, leaving two cards remaining. One that gets converted mana cost four, and one that gets converted mana cost five. Let's hope we don't run out of T-words. But um, I don't care for a sense of humor. Twisted Reflection. This is another clever design. It's an entwined spell that has two different blue abilities, shrinking and power toughness swapping. The two abilities combine to do something that blue specifically doesn't do, destroying a creature, one with power six or less, since these two abilities even combined aren't a thing blue does, the entwine cost which lets you do both is in the color that does destroy creatures all the time, black. I like that. I really like the idea behind this, where both of these abilities feel blue, but if you put them together, all of a sudden it becomes a black ability, and bam, they cover that by going, well, we'll just make it a black entwine. This feels really well put together. This, to me, is exceptionally good card design, and I'm a huge fan of it. Well done. Oh, Urza. My sweet Lord Urza, so happy to see you, baby. All right, Urza was one of the first major characters in Magic. His name appears in two cards of Alpha, Urza's glasses and Urza's sunglasses. The man apparently likes eye coverage. And he was the main character of Magic's first major story, The Brothers Ward, first told in part in the set Antiquities. As long as I've been interacting with the Magic public, there's been a request for an Urza card. I made one in Instable in the silver-bordered universe. He's a disembodied head. But players still want one in Black Border Magic. You're damn right we do. And we're going to want Planeswalker versions too. So keep them coming. And speaking of keep it coming, guys, I haven't forgotten. I will be doing a lore video specifically keyed to this Urza and the point he exists in right now. And it's going to be a fun one. So stick around for that. All right. We knew we wanted to make an Urza card. The question was, from what time? Where in his life do we choose? After much thought, we decided to start at the beginning. Back in his Artificer days, the time era of the Brothers War. With that choice, we leaned into making an awesome Artificer, something you'd want to put in an artifact-themed deck. We gave him three abilities. First, to make Constructs. After all, he's famous for making giant artifact creature armies. Yeah, actually, he is famous for making golems. That's how he won the hand of a princess. We made them variably tied to artifacts so they get bigger with the more artifacts you got onto the battlefield, including other Constructs. Secondly, we gave him a Mana Generation ability to allow you to use your artifacts to cast more artifacts, Third, we gave him a flashy ability to cast potentially any spell off the top of your library. We added in the shuffle to keep the card from doing degenerative things. Hopefully, all of those asking for a Black Border Urza card can finally enjoy him. Yes, honestly, I truly can. I'm, I'm, a super, I'm a super fan of this. This is an awesome card to be ending out our stroll through this behind-the-scenes information look. I definitely enjoy it. So I hope that you've enjoyed this as well. I'm going to hand it back over to the full screen version of me so you can enjoy my handsomeness. I don't know about you, but for me, that was very exciting. I definitely enjoyed that. I really had no idea that white was capped out 
at the biggest bonus it's being able to give us plus two plus two. I feel like that was the most surprising thing to me, but I'm glad that green gets the big smash because I'm all about the big smash, son. You know what else I'm about? The golden scroll. These are the people who have my back on Patreon or through channel memberships. We are welcoming our newest member, Skyfire! Thanks for joining up on my Patreon. I genuinely appreciate it, as I appreciate everybody who financially supports the work that I do here. It means a lot. Thanks for having my back, friends. And if you're not doing that, maybe you should go and have an inner deeper behind the scenes look at my Patreon and hook me up with the sweet, sweet money cheddar. Make daddy happy. Give daddy cheddar to buy cheddar. That smoked cheddar. All right, I've said enough. At this point, it's time for me to go. So thanks for being here, and I'm history, oh baby!